So we're gonna, yeah, so we'll have um, good morning and such a special happy Hanukkah. Really great to be here together. Today is the fifth day of Hanukkah. I know, I know last night we all lit the fifth candle, which makes it a really special day because now we have more light than, than in darkness, right? There's eight branches on the menorah, split, you know, four and four, as you can see. And now we've crossed onto the side of more light. So Hanukkah is the, gives us every single day of Hanukkah. I mean, everywhere we go, the, you know, we were talking about like the public menorah lightings and the car parades and seeing menorahs in people's windows and, you know, wherever you are, it just gives us this beautiful feeling of just sharing and spreading light. So a really great morning for us to meet on the fifth day of Hanukkah, where the whole message is that we are adding more and more light, right? So there's the physical light that we're adding into this world. And of course, the spiritual light and the warmth and spirituality that we bring into everything that we do. And that's really a very important part of what Hanukkah is all about. So let's talk about a few things about Hanukkah. And if anyone would like to share, I'd love to hear from you. So first and foremost, um, tomorrow, as we are, we have our class today on Friday, Shabbos is Rosh Chodesh. Uh, Shabbos and Sunday is Rosh Chodesh of the month of Teves. So um, it's a very, it's a special Shabbos and a very, um, and there's increased Torah readings and Hallel and, and many things that we will add on this Shabbos. So definitely a Shabbos of celebration. In addition to being Hanukkah, it is also um, Shabbos of Rosh Chodesh. So something to keep in mind that tomorrow we will add in Hallel and extra prayers in Shul or wherever we may be. So happy Rosh Chodesh to everybody. <laughs> so I'll maybe let's start with that because it's interesting because Rosh Chodesh, you know, is a day, a special day that is um, Jewish women celebrate Rosh Chodesh, right? It's a holiday that was given to us for not participating in the, in the, golden, in the sin of the golden calf. And Hanukkah is also has a very, very strong message to women. Um, there's many, many great women in the story of Hanukkah who are tremendous heroines, women who really gave so much of themselves so that we should have the freedoms that we have today. And one of the very famous women, right, that I think we know about is Yehudis. Yehudis, who was the daughter of the Kohen Gadol, and she had had enough. Um, uh, in addition to the decrees that the Greeks had imposed on all the Jewish people, they had also imposed terrible decrees on Jewish women and young brides. And they had had enough of it. And she actually said to the elders of the Jewish people, let me, let me try and help out over here. I have an idea. And it was no question, very, very miraculous. But what she did was she really took, um, it was tremendous, tremendous self-sacrifice, tremendous Mr. Snefesh to say, I am going to do whatever I can physically to change the course of this battle and help the Jewish people. And sure enough, we know that she was victorious. She was able to kill the general. Are you familiar with the story of Yehudis? Yeah. So she was able to kill the general Halifornis and then go back to the Jewish camp and say, you know, to, to, the, to the Jewish elders, you know, we, we've got this now. And we know that it was tremendously miraculous. I mean, think about according to nature. I mean, the fact that the Greeks even allowed her in their camp and gave her access to the general was a, an absolute miracle. And the fact that she was able to carry out her plan, Hashem really went along, you know, followed and, and allowed her to do this. And this tremendous miracle happened where it really changed the tide of the battle and the Jews were able to gain the upper hand and eventually, you know, finally were able to chase the Greeks out of the land of Israel and reclaim the, the Holy Temple. And that happened on the 25th day of Kislev, right? We have a little hint of that in the name of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is, stands for Hanu Chafhe. They rested on the 25th day. Chafhe represents 25 in, in Hebrew, in the numerical value. Chaf is 20, He is five. So they rested on the 25th day. So we see that it's hinted to us in the actual name of Hanukkah. So every year, subsequently, since this tremendous miracle that happened to the Jewish people, we celebrate. And what's really fascinating is that throughout the generations, Hanukkah looks really very similar. We light our menorahs, we have the traditions, we have the customs. You know, yesterday Zalman said to me, you know, Hanukkah is so much fun. I'm able to, <laughs> what he thought was so much fun is I get, it's like a yuntif, it's a holiday, but it's also a weekday. <laughs> you know, like, it, you know, I'm able to like go about and do all of my things and play his electronics, which, you know, was very important to him. 
but yet there's so much joy and there's 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 so much that we add every single day. I mean, the extra prayers that we say and the feeling that we have of adding light and warmth into our homes and into the community. There's something just very unique about this holiday. And I think that, you know, most people will say that there's, I mean, every holiday has its unique and special values and virtues and, and customs and mitzvahs that we do. Um, but Hanukkah almost seems like it really represents what Hanukkah is about. I mean, we're just, we're going about our mundane lives. We're going to work, we're going to school, we're doing what we have to do. But yet every day is infused with this beautiful message of Hanukkah, of adding light, which makes it so unique and special if you think about it. Because what is Hanukkah all about? Let's just go back a little bit. When the Assyrian Greeks took over the land of Israel, what happened? What did they do? They came in and slowly but surely, they started changing just, you know, simple things. Slowly they said to the Jewish people, oh, we don't want you doing this. You can't follow this law. You can't do this mitzvah. But they said to the Jews, we're very happy to have you live here in this land. Just be like us. It wasn't like they came in and they said, one, two, three, like Haman. We want all Jews gone on the same exact day. Out of here, done, no Jewish people. No, the Greeks, for whatever their motives were, they were happy to have the land of Israel. I mean, they were, as we all know, the Greek culture was very into exercise and their body and their physical fitness and who they were. It was all the exterior. So they said to the Jewish people living there, you are welcome to live here, but you must live like us. You must change your ways. And it probably started off in a more of a peaceful way, but of course the Jews would not follow in their ways. And slowly but surely, they enacted very, very strict and difficult laws on the Jewish people. Primarily, what they said is they took away our fundamental mitzvot, right? They said, no bris milah, no Shabbos, no kosher, no Jewish education. Well, hey, what happens when you take that away? <laughs> what are we left with? And so what happened was at that point, when it became so severe, idol worship, I mean, things that they felt what was what was the idol worship of that day it was also their pagan ideas it was all about the the physical things of who we are and we know that judaism as much as physical is important we need to infuse it with spirituality we know that a body and a soul are very very holy in yiddishkeit in judaism but they have to come together we need to combine it that's the beauty of judaism is that we take the physical and we infuse it with spirituality we have our bodies, but we have a neshama is what really leads our body into everything that it has to do. And it constantly reminds us to connect to Hashem. So when the Greeks took over the land of Israel, they demanded and they enacted all these terrible, terrible laws that would not allow the Jewish people to live as Jews. And it got from, you know, from bad to worse to terrible to anything that you can imagine. And many Jews were losing their lives because they would not follow in the paths of, of the Greeks. Now, sadly, there were Jews who did follow in the paths of the Greeks. There's a very cute children's video about Hanukkah where you have uh, these kids describing, you know, all the different things. So you have some kids who are saying, oh, come get that cool haircut and, you know, come and follow what, what everyone else is doing and put on that weird looking toga, whatever, whatever it might be. And then this other kid is saying, no, we must be strong to our roots and we have to follow in the ways of Hashem. And let's, let's, let's be real for a second. Let's think about today's society. Think about Hanukkah. Hanukkah goes this week. It was literally a full week. It began on a Sunday and it's ending on a Sunday. We had a, a full week of school, of work, of shopping, of doing things. And, but yet every day, although it may seem physical, there was so much spirituality involved, right? We lit the menorah. We encouraged others to do it. We daven, we learn, we, we, we added halal in our prayers. We add al hanisim, thanking God for this incredible miracle by yamim hahem, that he did for the Jews then, ubizman hazeh. What do we say in Alanisim? We thank God for the miracles that we have today. Every single day, we thank God for those miracles that he gives us and that he, he gifts us with literally every single moment of our lives. So when the Greeks put in all of these laws and they enacted everything, and when they saw that the Jews weren't doing it peacefully, they enforced, they started enforcing them and um, and that is what started happening is where they invaded the, the Holy Temple, they set up 
pagan idols all over the country. They started fighting and really making life very, very, very difficult for the Jews living in Israel. And that is where the Maccabees, Matisyahu and his five sons said, you know, this is it, enough. You know, there's so much that we can handle. There's so much that we can take from you, but we are done. And we are going to reclaim our temple. We are going to reclaim our country. And we are not going to allow the Greeks to dictate how Jewish people should live our lives. And that is when they start this revolt, this rebellion of the Maccabees. Again, what does Maccabees stand for? Think about, think about how the whole story comes about. It's me kamocha ba'elam Hashem. Whoever is with God, whoever is for God, whoever believes in that path, come with us. We want people who believe because we know that we are a very small and we are an inadequate army according to nature. But if we have Hashem on our side, which we do, then we can overcome and we can defeat and, and we can beat the Greeks and be victorious. And that is what happened. Literally a very small group of Jewish people gathered together, we know in the famous city of Modin, and they start their battle. Slowly but surely, they gather more Jews. And we know the tremendous miracles that happened because of it. So Hanukkah, there's clear, it's, it was miraculous from the battles, from how the Jews gathered, how they finally reclaim the Beis Hamikdash, right? They reclaim the Holy Temple. They come inside and then once again, what do they see? Now think about this. The Greeks did not destroy the Holy Temple. Our other enemies, what did they do? They burnt it to the ground. The Greeks did not do that. They kept the Beis Hamikdash standing in its full glory. But what did they do? They tried to make it impure, but it was impossible because the Greeks were not the ones who could make the Beis Hamikdash impure. The holy temple was way too holy. There was way too much godliness there for them to do it. And sure enough, what happens when the Jews come in, right? When the, when the, when the Maccabees and all the Jewish people finally reclaim the Beis Hamikdash, and I'm assuming they only sent the Kohanim inside as what is, what is allowed according to Jewish law, it's a mess, but it's standing. But what did the Greeks do? They, what they tried to do, right, is to bring impurities into the Holy Temple. So of course, right away, the Kohanim go and they clean up the Beis HaMikdash and they wanna light the menorah, okay? So now the Greeks, again, in this whole process of just taking away our spirituality, they didn't dump out all the special oil, right? That was, that was, that was put in there for the for lighting of the, of the menorah every single day. But what they did is they cracked the seals. The way it was done is the, the actual, the oil from, for that was used in the base of Mikdash was actually squeezed, I believe it was hand squeezed in a city called Tokea, which is in the North of Israel. And they would bring it into the base of Mikdash and the high priest had a stamp, a seal on top of the, of the bottle of the, each oil. I mean, we know today we buy, we buy kosher food or even for just health reasons. You don't buy a bottle of anything that has any rip or any crack or any tear on it. We want all of our food to be 100% pure and clean. And especially when it's kosher, right? Even more so when we travel and we buy sealed packages, we make sure that it's double wrapped, triple wrapped, right? To keep the purity of kashrus in our food. So when they came into the Beis Hamikdash, what they saw was there were many jugs of oil, but the seal of the Beis Hamikdash of a Kohen Gadol was taken off. What did the Greeks do? Again, their plan, have the oil, light the menorah, but not spiritually. Take away the root of why we do it. They kept the oil, but they cracked, they broke off the seal of the Kohen Gadol, trying to take away who we are, our essence of Yiddishkeit, the essence of Judaism. So when the Kohanim came in there, they probably had a dilemma. They thought, one second, there's a lot of oil here. We could light the menorah with it, but we won't. We need to find oil that has the seal of the Kohen Gadol. Because if we use the oil that the Greeks left here for us, then we are doing what the Greeks want us to do. They want us to do it in a way where, ah, we bend a little bit. Ah, not exactly the way the Torah wants us to do it. We will not allow that. And that was this miracle. The miracle was that they found a tiny little flask of oil that still had the seal of the Beis HaMikdash, a prized possession. It was, it was hidden, it was found, it was a miracle. And so the only challenge was that that little flask of oil was only enough to light for one day. Right, the menorah burned consecutively, continuously. Yeah. And so what happened was they decided to light it 
And in the meantime, immediately they sent off some people to go and produce more olive oil from the city of Tokea to bring back. But that would take several days, not like today, you know, hop, skip, and a jump. <laughs> So, you know, Amazon and it's delivered to your door. Not exactly. So it took, they say the process took about seven days. So hence, this is what happens. So the first day they lit the menorah. And the miracle was what happened that it lit, it stayed lit for the eight days until the messengers came back with the new oil. So then there's a question. So why do we light the menorah for eight days? If the first day we already had the oil, right? Really, you would think it should be seven days. But the rabbis instituted that we do eight days because the first day we commemorate the miracle of finding that oil. The fact that we found the oil that was necessary to light the menorah in a way that Hashem had commanded us to do was a miracle in itself. Because of that, we, we light the menorah for eight days, right? So our menorahs have eight branches. The menorah in the Beis Hamikdash actually had six branches and a shamash. Our menorahs have eight branches and a shamash to commemorate and to give thanks to Hashem for this tremendous miracle that he gave us in you know, being able to find the oil, being able to suppress what the Greeks wanted to do to us and be able to bring much more light and warmth into this world. So that is just this basic idea of what we see, what is so, so important about this holiday, probably more than any other holiday. The Greeks wanted to take away, as we said, the essence and the core of who we are. And what Hanukkah teaches us is that we can celebrate on a weekday. We can celebrate in any country, any location, wherever we are, we have the ability to bring light. It says that our neshama is compared to a flame, right? Kiner Hashem nishma sadam. It is a flame of God. Judaism is surrounded with mitzvot that really bring light and warmth. I mean, we're going to light the menorah today. We're going to light the Shabbos candles. We're constantly infusing this world with light. Now, there's a famous Hebrew saying that says, Ma'at or doche A little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness, right? I mean, if I light a candle in my bright room right now, hooray, it's pretty. But do I really need that candle? I mean, today we have electricity. But if I turn off the lights and then I light my candle, wow, that light, it just shines everywhere. And I appreciate that light so much. So the world today is in a spiritual darkness. Some of us can see, some of us cannot see it. But what we know is that every mitzvah that we do, every good deed that we do adds a candle, adds a flame, adds a light and brings in spirituality into this world. And so the message of Hanukkah, as we said, is by Yamim Mahim Bizman Hazeh. The miracles Hashem did for us back then are just as relevant today. 2021, literally no different than the year that we celebrated Hanukkah because we have our own battles to fight. We have our own challenges going on around us and we have to do whatever we can to be that light and to bring in that light into the entire world. So what's interesting, anyone wanna add something? Okay, <laughs> thank you. So there's another, there's a wonderful message, another wonderful message that we have from the story of Hanukkah, and that's with the oil. Who's been frying latkes this week or donuts? Uh, oh, my Sima made such amazing stuff. I mean, deep fried chocolate, Oreos. I mean, it, this week, it just doesn't end. Wait a minute, so, Jeannie, excuse me. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. Did you say deep fried chocolate? Oh yeah, yeah, I can send you the recipe. She wrapped yeah. chocolate bars in a batter and deep fry them. Yes. Wow. They were quite delicious. <laughs> we did para for people who were para and we did dairy for those who were dairy on two sides of the kitchen. I think yes, you should have that it's a safe fair. I mean, yes. that's one of the oh, things to fry. I have to take it, take wow. it further. Yeah, yeah, it was really, she found some recipes. She had watched a, a cooking uh, show and saw. So she's going to please make them for Hanukkah. I'm like, of course, for Hanukkah, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So which brings us to thank you, to the oil, right? So we know that the miracle happened, you know, with that small flask of oil and the miracle of the battle. But oil has something fascinating. And I, to me, this message really stands out in one of the really great messages of Hanukkah. So oil has many different components to it, but we'll touch upon two right now. On the one hand, oil, as we know, for those of us who fry this week, right? Anything that you put oil on, your paper towel, you touch the oil with your finger, you touch a piece of paper, everything gets oily, right? 
oil saturates whatever it becomes in contact with the counters, the floor, the, I mean, literally it's like, it, it takes time to clean it up. It, 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 it soaks in, right? You put it on a piece of paper towel, it soaks into that thing. It becomes one, it saturates it. On the other hand, right? This is like the famous science experiment everyone's always done in school, right? If you mix oil and water, what happens? Automatically the oil rises, it separates. It doesn't become one with the water, usually separates to the top, which is very, very interesting. And this is really a good lesson for us in how we live and how we live our lives in this, in this physical world and in Gullis that we live in. You know, on the one hand, we have to take the message from oil and it, it permeates everything in this world. We're involved in the world. We go about, we do our business, we meet with people, we do things. But on the other hand, what does the oil remind us? We're different, we separate. There are times that we need to be together and we need to be very involved in the world. And there are times that we need to say, no, this is not for me. This is not for a Jewish woman. This is not for a Jewish man. This is not for Jewish children. And we need to differentiate where that is. And so the oil of Hanukkah, aside from bringing light into this world, it really gives us a very important message about our personal growth and in our service to Hashem. Yiddish guide has to saturate every single part of who we are. And we have to remember that that always must be a part of us. But when we live in a physical world and there are challenges that come with that, we have to recognize who we are. As a Jewish people, as the oil, we don't always mix, right? There are times that we need to recognize where our role is and where we belong and what we have to do. So when, you know, comes sundown on a Friday night, here we are, we're lighting our Shabbos candles, we're getting ready to celebrate with our families, you know, come the time to light the menorah, we're together, we're gathering, we're doing whatever we have to do, whether we're shopping in a grocery store, looking at the items for the kosher symbol, right? We're, we're separated. We are in this world, but yet we are doing things away in the way that Hashem has, has really, has, has given us and the path that Hashem has put forth, uh, forth, you know, for us in the way to, in the way to live our lives as Jewish people. So that's just another very important and beautiful message that we have from, from the oil of Hanukkah that we can also really apply, you know, you know, just like years ago, the Jews lit the candles with very similar oil, I'm assuming it was pretty much the same. And today we light our candles with that olive oil, again, to remind us the wonderful, um, the incredible gifts and miracles that Hashem does for us. And just to conclude, there's another um, wonderful message that we could take from the story of Hanukkah. And that is again, that we, I'm just gonna, just a little bit of a comparison between how the miracles of Hanukkah happen and the miracles of Purim. So it's interesting, the story of Hanukkah, as we saw, and as we've learned, was completely miraculous. We saw that, you know, from above, God sent the salvation. And if you think about it, on Hanukkah, we play with a dreidel, right? And if you look at the dreidel, how do you hold a dreidel? You hold it from the top and you spin the dreidel. Look at the miracle of Purim. Purim didn't seem so miraculous as it was happening. Everything seemed like it was just a coin according to nature. You know, the king gets mad, he kills his wife, he, hides, he brings in a new queen, Esther, and the story progresses all within what seemed like a natural occurrence. Of course, we know when we see how everything came together, it was all the hand of Hashem. That's really what happens in every day in our lives. Sometimes you say, ah, it's just, you know, it's moving along, it's going, it's happening. Every single moment of our lives is a miracle. Every single moment is guided by Hashem just like we saw once we saw the end of the story of Purim and the miracles that happened. But yet it seemed like it was going with the flow of nature. Think about the grog, you know, the gragger that we, that we spin on Purim, where do we hold it? On the bottom, showing that Purim was all within nature. Everything that happened in Purim just seemed to go with the flow of nature. And we hold it from the bottom, showing that it came from the bottom up. Hanukkah happened from the top down. Of course, it was all miraculous by Hashem, but in different paths of how it was done. Now, if you think about the story of Hanukkah, not too long ago, many of our grandparents or parents or great grandparents, I mean, they were living under the Soviet, you know, the communist rule in Russia. Think about what the communists did. Very similar to what the Greeks did. The communists said, you can live here in Russia. You can live here, no problem under communism, but you cannot 
practice religion. And they did very basic same things. They closed mikvahs. They wouldn't allow young children in shul. They closed all the schools. They wouldn't allow bris milah, no kosher food. Very, very similar. So our grandparents, I mean, my parents were born in Russia. Just a very, very, very short time ago, not too long ago, our own parents and grandparents, I mean, just like our grandparents, great, you know, way back up, our ancestors, you know, had Hanukkah in the land of Israel. More recently, in more recent times, we've also had Hanukkah miracles. The Hanukkah miracles of Jews who had to live during those very, very difficult times and hide their menorah so that they could light a Hanukkah menorah, wherever it may have been whether it was in communist Russia or during the Holocaust or during difficult times in modern times. So as Jewish people, we have to recognize that the miracles that Hashem does for us constantly is a constant reminder of who we are as Jewish people. And, you know, come Hanukkah and we light the menorah, we have a very a visual. That reminder is right here in front of us. It's very easy to see, right? So what we have to think about, and I think that to me, that's a very, very important part of what Hanukkah is about, is taking this message that it's not something ancient. It's not something that just happened years ago. It is happening today. Now, thank God today we live in a free country where freedom of religion is allowed for all. But yet we do come across anti-Semitism and we come across people who are out to, to destroy us. And we have to stand strong. We have to stand strong like the menorah, right? A flame always flickers upward, right? No matter what you do to a flame, it always focuses upward. If you try and take a match or a candle, right? And you put it down, where does the flame go? Boom, it pops right back up, right? So we have to remember constantly, what is our mission? What is our message? To always be the flame, always be the light, always continue to shed light wherever we are. So there's a story that I, I recently saw, we Googled it this morning of a, in, I believe it was in 1996 in a place, a city in Pennsylvania where um, uh, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania where a Jewish family one night, their front window was, was broken and it was vandalized and people came to take their menorah. It was an act of, an act of anti-Semitism. It says that that, evening. This was like a very, a new set of development that had just been built a few years prior. There were about 1,800 homes there. And that evening it said that every home, over 1,800 homes, had a menorah in their window, Jews and non-Jews alike. Because what we have to remember is when we stand together, we are stronger together. And regardless of who we are or what our backgrounds might be, we all have to be the light and we all have to continue to share it um, as best as we can. So with that, I want to wish everyone a very happy Hanukkah. And let's continue to only see light, goodness, and happiness in, in everything that we do. And it should be a wonderful Shabbos and a happy Rosh Chodesh to everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Dini. That was Dini, wonderful. Dini, it was great. Thank you so much. If anyone would like to add a Hanukkah message, story, thought that you heard this week, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Well, Dini, I'll just share with you real quickly. I saw online um, an Israeli soldier, a little video, and he's standing in front of uh, what looks like it to be a menorah, and he's holding the sh like a shamash, like a big. Um, anyways, what it is, he explains. These are met the 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 holders was metal rockets that had been uh, t um, aimed at Israel. They were collected. They didn't harm anyone. They were collected and they were made into a menorah. Oh, so wow. one of the candles is like a, a rocket, a, you know, vertical rocket. And he says, we're turning darkness into light. Literally, we're lighting, we're taking these weapons of, you know, of destruction and we're turning them into candles for the Jewish people for hope and light bringing I thought that was so beautiful that is amazing, amazing. young Israeli soldier standing there you know telling the story beautifully that is absolutely beautiful absolutely magnificent there's a city um, in Israel right in the south of Israel Sterot which they get a lot of attacks and I believe they also have like I don't know if their menorah is also made of those rockets but again showing that what other people use for destruction we use for to bringing light and goodness into this world yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Oh, so yeah, my Jews said the menorah in the front in the in the front of the Chabad house in Sterot is made of rockets. Uh, so I wonder if it's that or a similar one. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That is 
What a powerful message. Yes. It really yes. Is. Yeah. Well, we should be able to see it with goodness, kindness, and peace. <laughs> That's I'm saying. I'm I'm saying. Saying. I'm yeah. Saying. yeah. So as we head into Shabbos, let's hope that well, only good news and, and happy good times. Amen. All, All right. right. Good job, everybody. everybody. We'll Amen. see you. Everybody have a great Amen. weekend. Yeah, you too. <laughs>